distance from here. Uh, you should come down and visit us sometime. I know that some of you live in Alaska, and it's quite a ride, but uh, <laughs> you make a left turn at the first iceberg, I guess, that you see, and uh, follow yourself south, I guess you do. Hey, that is a good T-shirt. <laughs> really, Bill has the greatest T-shirts, but we're talking about saving the environment and, and say, come on up and show them this one. Well, let's show them the front first. Bill, this is Bill Schultz. and he's going to wear a plain one this week. His, the Marine Mammal Stranding Center to rescue the, the, the Some mammal. little seals. That's great. And on the back it is, what the heck is that? The back, the back of the, the seal. seal. That's the back of the seal going right through him. That's it's great. It's also the back of me. That is. <laughs> that is. Terrific. Marine Mammal Stranding Center. But I was telling you folks that live a long distance, here we are in the central part of New Jersey, just very close to Atlantic City. Come on up for a minute, Ray. Let's introduce you. Come on. Yeah, come on. Oh, what the heck? I mean, not, not everybody comes that distance. I just think it's great, and he's turned into a great friend. And this is Ray Marino. Tony. 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 I'm calling him Ray. Tony, well, I met you. Tony Marino comes all the way from Astoria, Queens, mm -hmm. New York. Right. And you came down just to see us, right? Right. And have some of that Chinese food. Have some of that Chinese food. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks for coming down. Well, that's, you know, people, a lot of people drive down. Last week we had four people drive down from Orange and two people come down from uh, Newark. A lot of people drive down. It's nice to acknowledge that. We all set to go, got the Bibles open. Let's see what we can, what we can find out here as we look at Matthew 24, verse 31. We've just come through the, uh, it's on page uh, 26 in the New Testament. Now, remember the Bible runs from 1 to 600 in the Old Testament, and then you start over again in the New Testament from one to whatever it winds up at. And you're looking at page 26, you're at Matthew 24. Now Jesus has just come through telling us about all the doomsday things, you know. Are those wall lights up as bright as they can get? I guess, I'm not sure if they are or not, that would make it easier help. I'm trying to turn, hold the lights, at, yeah, that's, that's better. I'm trying to hold the lights overhead off to hold down the heat, you know, I mean, keep the heat out. He just got done talking to us about all the earthquakes and all of these things which we have translated and understand spiritually as being shaken down of old ways of thinking. But then Jesus gets to the point to tell you when you finally have overcome all of these old ways of thinking, when you finally overcome all of this fear and everything that's been holding you in bondage from them, from the system, what's going to happen? Now look at page 26, Matthew 24 and verse 31. So let's try to decode this esoterically. Matthew 24, verse 31, it says, And he, meaning God, shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. First of all, angels. You know what an angel is? The key is right there. The word E-L comes from the bull Mithra cult, which means the power within a person, the power within the flesh. Angel is a divine impulse that comes from the right hemisphere of the brain. And that's why all the angels' names are ending in L. Michael, Uriel, Raphael, Gabriel, because it's an inner impulse. Doesn't mean it's a person with wings. The wings are because it's from the higher realms of consciousness in the place of the air, which is the third stage of consciousness, which means where there is no thought. Earth, water, air is the third stage. So naturally your impulse comes from the higher realm of consciousness through the air, conveyed to you by an angel, so we always portray angels with wings, okay? That angel is an inner impulse. You'll start to feel in your higher consciousness an inner impulse. You know, you start to get a tug at you. That's why you're sitting here. What the heck are you doing sitting in the basement of Vito Shopping Center here on a Sunday morning? Because this tug came within you. This feeling has come within you. This impulse has come within you. That something being said here that you should hear. It's divine instinct. You are here. For well, the same reason that a goose goes from, there's a couple of seats right up front here, folks, if you'd like to have them. A couple of uh, new folks here that we had never seen before. <laughs> and her, come up here for a minute, Rita. I want to show everybody your purple side. Look at her purple outfit. Isn't this great? Look at this. It's a gift. It's a gift. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Her purple outfit. We were all telling you that this coming Thursday evening is a young lady going to do three TV shows on shiatsu and massage and nutrition and all these beautiful new age things, and here she is. So uh, <laughs> we'll look forward to that. Can I sit down there? Sure. <laughs> I see you brought Uncle Don. Would you like to come up too, Father Don, or would you just want to? I'll just sit here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Don, uh, Joan says I should bring you up. Just say hello to everybody. Oh, Don. No, Don doesn't want to come up. 
We're talking about angels, and Don walked in. I don't know if there's any, uh, I don't know if there's any connection there or not. <laughs> but the angel, then, is an inner impulse. Now, there's something important here that you're going to say. Look at this. He shall send his angel with a great sound of trumpet. What goes through a trumpet to make the sound? Breath. Okay, that means spirit. Wherever you see trumpet in the Bible, it means spirit. And why do they pick trumpet? Because what does a trumpet do? It produces harmony. Harmony. So here then, from that higher realm within you, will come the spirit that will bring a harmony to your life a feeling of harmony, beginning to put the pieces together, beginning to settle things down, beginning to come through all of the crises of your life, all of the shakings, all of, uh, all of the earthquakes and all of these other things which have shaken you, and finally you get, you break through that point where you can find, you begin to get a, harmo a harmonic type of understanding. It's like, it blows like the winds of the vibrations of what they call kundalini, and it starts to raise itself in cyclic forms in that circular pattern up until it pitches up to the pineal gland and stirs the right hemisphere of the brain. Beautiful. And the trumpet is spirit blooming. Let's take a look at this trumpet for just a second and see something in page 625 of the Old Testament. 625 of the Old Testament, the rest of you, the book of Jeremiah. Okay? Jeremiah chapter 4. And let me show you something, um, how you, you, you get further to understand what this is talking about. What you have in your hands is not a religious or holy book. What you have in your hands is a book of creative universal psychology. It is the understandings and the workings of the human mind. Because once you understand and are able to operate that mind within you, then all becomes well. Here's what's going on inside of you. In fact, this is you. Okay? Here you have the mainstay of your operation. And that, well, we're looking to the left or right, but it doesn't make it, just to make it a little more easier graphic for you. Here's the operation here. This is sealed off. Over here is a sealed off holy city. Okay, this is the right side. Okay, this is the part that you operate in. This is where all the madness comes from. All of the fighting, all of the guilt, all of the fear, all of the screaming, all of that stuff that comes in. There's an opening here. And everything comes in from the outside, from your friends, from your parents, from religion, from the government. Everything deposits in here from karmic, and it all bottles itself up here, and this is where you go nuts. When you turn your attention and direct yourself to the east, to the right side, now that we're facing this way, look, okay, you then have entrance here into the holy city. That's what this whole thing is about. That's what the Bible's about. And I'll show you how it operates here when uh, we get into this next little bit of, of reading. Jeremiah chapter 4. You with me? 625 in the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 5. Declare you in where? Judah. Okay? Declare you in Judah. And verse 5. Declare you in Judah and publish in Jerusalem. Blow the trumpet in the land. Cry together and say, Assemble yourselves and let us go into the defense cities, okay? Declare you in Judah. Go back to page 115 in your Old Testament. Let me show you something. It's Numbers chapter 2. Now this is the way in the earliest of times the tribes were set up in the desert. Here in the desert, in the center was the tabernacle. That represents the center of your consciousness. By the points of the compass, everything was set up. North, south, east, west, okay? In the, tri in the north was set up the tribe of Dan, and it represents your emotional nature. That's where the wars come from the north. That's why you'll always see in the Bible that they will bring war from the north. That's why the evangelists make a big mistake, and they're still trying to figure out how Russia is going to get, get into this. Even, no matter what Gorbachev does, oh, no, 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 Russia's going to come and, and bring war down from the north. Well, that's because Russia is the country to the farthest north of Israel, and it is used symbolically then to indicate that which comes from the north is always the emotions. That which will bring war on you and me is your emotional nature. That's what the Bible's trying to say. In the west, in the tribe of uh, Ephraim, which is the intellect. In the south is the tribe of Reuben, which is your physical. And in the east, at the point of the rising sun, is Judah. Now notice something, whenever you look north, east is always on the 
Very important. That's why Jesus said, cast your net to the right side. Cast yourself, cast your energies to the right hemisphere. Now, this is important, too, because when you start to read, you do what the people in religion have done all of these years. You get literal, you get intellectual. Once you get intellectual and you start literalizing all of this stuff, you then bring that which is the intellect or the West. And what happens when the West encroaches on the East? It blocks out the sun. It blocks out the light. It blocks out the spirit. You'll see it happen tonight. Around 7 o'clock or so, it starts getting dark, and the West now has encroached in on the East. The intellect has encroached in on the spirit. There is no more light. All is in darkness. You then will learn what? What does it say in Jeremiah 4, uh, uh, verse 5? It says, Declare you in Judah, publish in Jerusalem. Declare you in Judah. Declare yourself at the right hemisphere. Now, what about Jerusalem? Huh. Well, you say that's a city in Israel, a city over in the Holy Land. No, it isn't. In your New Testament, and I just got you jumping around a little bit because I want you to see this. In your New Testament, go to the page 177. The rest of you go to Galatians chapter 4. Chapter 4. And the reason I brought you to uh, the book of uh, Numbers was to show you that the tribe of Judah actually is camped at the right side to the east. Okay? Numbers 2, 3. Now look at with me, page 177 in the New Testament, Galatians chapter 4. And I want you to go to verse 24. It's talking about the Old Testament. It's talking about Abraham and Sarah. It says, which things are an allegory. An allegory is a symbolic story. In other words, it uses names and places not necessarily real to point out a spiritual aspect of life, to point out a, it's a symbolic story. And what does it say now about Jerusalem? For this is Agar in Mount Sinai, that's verse 25, and answers to Jerusalem which is now and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. That's the Jerusalem that we're talking about in Jeremiah when it says, blow the trumpet in the land, blow the trumpet in, 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 Ju in Judah and Jerusalem. And it says, gather then into the defense cities. Once again, as I showed you within you, that right side is defended. That right side is sealed off. In that right hemisphere of your brain cannot come one thought. Not one thought of yours can enter the right hemisphere of the brain. It's impossible. The thoughts that come into your mind are solely kept at the left side, the intellectual side, the carnal side, the material side. All of the fears come from the left side. All of the stresses come from the left side. All of the hate, all of the violence comes out of the left side. Nothing can go into the right side. That's why the only way you can enter into the right side is when you do as Jesus says, take no thought. When you do as Krishna says, and enter deep within yourself. When you do as Buddha says, and ascend up into nirvana. And when you have separated from all thought, when there is no longer any connection whatsoever, this opens up, and you drift into nirvana, and then the right side opens up, hemisphere opens up, brain cells at the right side start to activate, and Jesus Christ says, when you cast your energy to the right side, you shall fall. Mind. And that's when you begin to understand this stuff. That's when you begin to understand what your purpose is. That's when you begin to understand why there are things happening. Why are, why are, are, are dolphins and whales like he's got beating themselves? Because nature is making a statement that she has been violated. Nature is making a statement that she has been raped by us. And as I said to you a couple of weeks ago, then we sent scientists down to study the dolphins and scientists down to study the whales to find out what's going on. Why are they doing this? But if there were scientists on far distant, pla distant planets looking, what would they say? Wait a minute, there's something with the human species. Forget the dolphin species for a minute. There's something with the human species. Their children are killing themselves. Their teenagers are beaching themselves. Is nature making a statement? And so then, as we wrap up this part, as we begin to understand assembling yourself in Judah, go back to that point where we were with, in Matthew, Matthew 24. Matthew 24, where Jesus is speaking. If you want to take this stuff literally, help yourself. Help yourself, but then sit with them and watch the world devour itself in the violence and in the filth and in the hurt. Or else you can start coming on the, on the terms of Buddha, on the terms of Krishna, on the terms of Jesus Christ, and entering within spiritually and beginning to understand the mystic revolution, the mystic revelation which is being given to all people. You begin to understand the new age which is pouring down on all people, saying to you, look within yourself for the answers. Don't look at me. I'm not asking you to believe anything. It's not necessary for you to believe anything. How can you believe anything? 
It's impossible. Buddha himself said, I do not believe anything until I know the truth. The only way you'll ever know is from within yourself. You'll never know from any preacher. You'll never know from any teacher. You'll never know from any book. You'll never know from any song. But you will know from within yourself. And if you camp yourself at the right side, if you camp yourself... Look. Look. The sun sits in the heavens. It comes down, and on December the 21st, it enters the constellation, the Southern Cross. It's crucified on December the 21st. December the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, it's called the winter solstice. The sun sits in the bowels of the earth three days and three nights. It's entombed. On December the 25th, the day we call Christmas, by the power of the trajectory of the earth, the sun is born. It begins its upward arc, and it is born out of the constellation Virgo. It's born of a virgin. It rises itself up to the lamb where the burnt offering, it sits at the right hand of power in the eastern sky, and summer comes. And all of the blossoms come out, and all of the flowers come out, and all of that which has been dead for the winter of the life is restored. Why does this happen? Because inside of you, right here in the center of your tummy, is a place called the solar plexus. It is the place of the sun. And if through that same energy out of the virgin consciousness, Virgo, you will allow that sun to rise, it will consummate itself with the pineal, which is Aries. It will sit at the right hand in the eastern sky, and summer will come to your life. All of that which has been dead, all of that which has been barren, will be renewed. As it is without... Is that thing falling? Yeah. <laughs> Sun's going down! Excuse me. It's not a thing to do on television, but... I thought, I didn't know whether I was... When I said the sun was going down, I saw this thing going down. <laughs> Break! Okay. All right. So, he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect. And remember, his elect always sit at the right side. See, his elect, when you say his elect are Jews, Jews are God's chosen people. Do you remember? I remember, I remember the story about, you know, Jews have so much trouble and they had so much persecution in their life. And the rabbi was sitting in the temple one time and the rabbi says, I gavolt, I what forgot this is, it's a mess. I don't think this is good. What, what am I doing? What kind of life? Ay, 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 And he said, Rabbi, who's this? What? Who? What? Who? What? Who's that? What? <laughs> this is God. Hey, <laughs> Gavolt, what? God, this is really God? This is God. Why are you crying, Rabbi? Well, listen. The thing for cock is a mess. The whole thing of my people is... I want to ask you a question. This is really God up there. Yes, what? Go ahead, Rabbi. He says, did you... Uh, is this true that uh, we are God's chosen people? That's right, Rabbi. Listen, thinks you could maybe choose somebody else for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan. Didn't really happen, but it didn't. <laughs> So anyhow, we sit at the right hand when we meditate. That's all you have to do. This whole thing can, can happen when you kick your shoes off, hit the floor, and meditate, and raise yourself up to the right side, up to the right hemisphere. And there you are touched by that which is the light. Okay? Okay. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. You remember I showed you before? Because once you enter into the right side, which is the eastern side, you bring with you then that which is the emotions, that which is the intellect, that which is the physical, and all then becomes renewed by the power of the right hand. Every one of us in this building, every one of us in the world, are 90% ignorant. We only use 10%. That's why God asked you to tithe. And people who should have known better grabbed it as a way to make a buck. And they say, give me 10% of your money. No, nobody wants 10% of your money. Give them the 10%, which is the left side. And when you sh shut that down, he opens up the right side, which is the right hemisphere. And then you start to... I'm not, you know, sometimes, oh, well, this is a philosophy. Wait, let me tell you something. Carl Jung, who's one of the most eminent psychiatrists who was a contemporary of Sigmund Freud. I mean, let's, if you want to use somebody, you know, intellectual people who study this stuff, he came up with the conclusion hundreds or hundred years ago that, yes, the place that we call God dwells at the right hemisphere of the brain. Now, that doesn't, you know, doesn't mean you should take his word over Jesus, but, you know, we have a tendency to do that. Hey, the guy's a psychiatrist. He don't want hey, so I'll take that. Okay, now let's take a look at something here, a little interesting. We come to uh, Matthew 24, 32. We've come through all of the, all of the shaking, all of the, 
all of the earthquakes and all of the things which go on within us. And many of us are still experiencing these things, the shaking down. But look, and here's the good part now, okay? We come through all this Matthew 24 trouble in our minds as we start to move away from the intellectual side to the spiritual side. Look at this. Now learn a parable, Matthew 24, verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. We're going to allow the, the, the carnal mind to die. We're going to raise ourselves up into the holy place. And Jesus is saying, learn a parable of the fig tree. Why is this important? Why is the fig in mysticism important? Why is it a holy fruit? The reason is because a fig blossoms on the inside. That's why it's used as a mystical fruit. If you cut open a fig, all of its blossoms are inside. This is what's so beautiful. And this is what's, this is what's being said. The fig tree's you. Say, it's me. Now, what's he care about a fig tree? What is it not? It's you and me. That, this is allegorical. This is mysticism. They use symbols. And so what he's saying is the parable of the fig tree. You are the tree, the tree of life, see? And the point is that you will begin then to blossom on the inside. OK? That's the beautiful part. Now, but first there's got to be evidences. What, look what he says here, Matthew 24, 32. When his branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Summer is near. You know what I'm saying? Ha- the point here, when you talk about you start to see leaves, is what Buddha said. You've got to have three things. You've got to have a document. You've got your document. You've got to have to begin to understand what the document means. You've got to be understanding the mysticism, the numerology. You've got to understand the parables and all of these things of the Bible. And then he says, you've got to put it into practice. Does it work? If it doesn't work, chuck it. It's a lie. There is no thing to wait until you die in order for this to work. You know, that is not a good deal. You come to church and you give all of this money and you sit and shut up with the promise that everything good happens after you die. I don't want to get involved in that. That is not a good deal. You should get a little better deal. You want something now, okay? And that's what Jesus is saying. God is not a God of the dead. God is a God of the living. So what happens? You start to put this in practice. You go into your meditation, and does your life change? Do you feel different? Do you start to feel that you have a purpose? Do you start to feel you're beginning to understand what the heck all of this stuff is about? Those are the leaves. You haven't blossomed but those are the leaves. You know that there is a change within you because at least, you know how you know there's a change within you? Turn on the Christian television. You used to idolize these people. Now you look at them and, ah, and you'll turn it off quick. <laughs> you'll know there's a change. Okay. As soon as they whip out the credit cards, you're on your way. And, and as soon as they start talking about the fears and the threats and, and all of the guilt, you're on your way because you know that has no place in God's domain trying to set you free from all of that stuff. So look, look what the leaves are. It says, Matthew 24, 32. Learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender. OK, leaves come. Whose branch? Who, you know, when his branch, OK, go with me to page 105 in the New Testament. And for the rest of you, go to John 15. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John 15. And let's, let's, let's identify the branch. Okay, let's identify the branch. John 15, and let's go to verse 5. What does Jesus Christ say here? I am the vine, you are the branch. Okay, so what is it now? You come in here, you've been beaten, bruised, bloodied by them. You've followed them all of your life. You've tithed money to them all of your life. You've done everything they said you should do. And you come staggering down the stairs, and all of a sudden, you open yourself to yourself. For the first time, you meet yourself. You meet someone deep inside of you you never even knew existed. And when you have done that, you have been the branch which has now grafted itself onto the vine. The vine is deep within you. The vine is deep within you, waiting for you to come and graft that branch onto it. In other words, plug into the source of that which is life. We've got all lights in here so you can see, okay? Only if we turn the power on. There's something that we have to do in order to get the lights to go on. We have to turn the power on. It won't come on by itself. We have to turn it on. And this is the same thing. When you go into meditation, you are taking that which is the branch, 
which is barren in your life, which has no leaves on it, has no fruits on it, is going through a constant winter, and you are all of a sudden starting to touch it, and then you start to feel this difference. You start to feel this oneness with something beyond that which you've ever been told even exists. You start to begin to feel an attachment to what we call God. And that's what he said. He said, when his branch is yet tender, when you are still very young in this movement, you don't have to become a guru. When his branch is very tender, what does he say then? Matthew 24, verse 32. What does he say? Back where we were, page 26. When his branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, what happens then? Huh? You know that summer is coming close. And do you understand what summer is? What do we say? Remember we showed you before? What is summer? Summer is when the burnt offering has taken place. You know, you know what the burnt offering is? Do, do, do you know that in the Old Testament they used to pick an animal and then they'd burn it up and they'd say, this, you know what a burnt offering is? I'll show you what the burnt offering is. Aries, the ram. Okay? This constellation up here, Aries, the ram. When the sun, which is the fire, through the trajectory of the earth, rises and consumes Aries the ram. What happens? Spring. Summer. All new life appears. The burnt offering must take place. See? But what they did, they took it literally and they put animals on an altar and cooked them. See? Until finally in Psalm 40, David says, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, whoa. This isn't what you intended. Burnt offerings, you didn't want that. The animal that you wanted put on the altar is in here. Not a four-legged animal. Do you honestly, see, this is as bad as people saying God's plotting a nuclear war. We, they thought that God was going to let them off the hook for all the scuzzball things they did by killing an animal. <laughs> hey, it's your fault. Yeah, yeah you did it. Yeah, don't blame me. Look at this thing. Say, I'm going to blame him. Uh -huh. Zippo, hey, I'm, let's go out, Lulu. I paid my debt. Here he goes again. Isn't it? I'm off the hook. The goat did it. <laughs> I know I was a nice guy. See? And this is the same thing. So what happens then here? Who is the Aries? Where is the Aries within you? The Aries within you is the pineal gland of the brain. It's that center part of the brain that lights up the right hemisphere. Come on with me. First, 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 first uh, book in the Bible, Genesis. Read it again. You got to see it over and over again. Come on, everybody look at this. I want you to see it with your own two little eyes. Genesis 32. Spelled a little differently, but 4,000 years ago. Genesis 32, first book in the Bible. Can't find this one, then we got to start remedial reading. We don't have to worry about this uh, stuff. Genesis 32. You with me? Everybody find it? Okay, I want to wait till I make sure everybody sees it. That's how important this is. Genesis 32. Okay. Verse 30. And what did Jacob say after he has been wrestling? And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. I mean, do you need two and two to make four? Do you understand he had seen God face to face? Why? Because his energies, his fire had risen up and had consumed. The burnt offering had happened. And when, don't you see, when the energy from the abdomen, the solar plexus, reaches up to the pineal, then it opens up the right side and summer comes to your life. It's all automatic. You don't have to do anything but expose yourself to it. Allow it to happen. Allow the energy of the fire, the passions of the solar plexus to rise up, consume the pineal gland, which is Aries. The burnt offering happens and then to the right side it goes. The right side opens up the right hemisphere of your brain and all summer comes to your life. What's wrong with that? What's evil about that? Isn't it about time? Say. And you know what, I was reading in the paper today, all the kids are coming against their parents. And in, 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 in the Asbury Park Press, it says, the kids are saying, hey, turn the lights off. You're wasting electricity. Hey, don't buy any tuna fish if they kill the dolphins. Hey, don't wear furs. Hey, don't buy Gillette products because they're torturing animals. And all the kids are saying, why are they little? Because of what's happening. The new age is here. These are the end times of the old age, and the new age is here, and the first ones that are going to recognize it are the children because they're the ones that are closest to God. They were in 
his place and received his instruction just a little while ago. And all of a sudden, they get caught up in all of this stuff. And it's very important to them. It's very important to them that you're nice to dolphins. But you don't even know what a dolphin is. You think, well, I'll take them to see. No, they understand what these things are. And so it's all over the country now. Something's going on. The kids are saying to their parents, hey, wait a minute. What are you doing with that fur coat on? Oh, this is my, I bought this in Bond with tellers. <laughs> Your mother has to, and the kids are saying, you know what you look like? You look like a dead fox. <laughs> you got, what do you got a dead fox hanging around your neck for? You see? Because it's very important to them. Now, do you know why? It's right. We want to be comfortable. We want to be nice. But you know, there's something more important. Now, people are beginning to understand. Something suffered so horribly so us we could look nice. See? So those things are becoming important to us. Now, they didn't used to be important, but this is a new age. <laughs> It's an age of Christ consciousness. It's an age of Krishna consciousness. It's an age of Buddha consciousness. And we all together, then we, we stand with one another, and we say, hey, wait a minute. Maybe, maybe we can change the way. Not only maybe, we will change the way. We'll turn things around, and all things will become new. But even here, it says here, when that branch is tender, even at a young, you'll begin to see the leaves. You'll begin to see the results of the spiritual fruit that's going to blossom inside of you. And I am so, ang I'm so like Sean and AJ, they come down here on Tuesday nights for meditation, bring their kids with them. And then the kids lay on the floor, they go to sleep. That doesn't make any difference. They are still in the midst of the positive vibrations that are being sent up here by people who are reaching up to that place of nirvana. And you say, oh, well, I don't know. You know, my kids are too young for this. No, you're too old for it. They're primed for it. The closer, the younger they are, the closer they are to God. And it all becomes very beautiful to them. Takes them back very quickly to where they were. You know, eternal life is eternal life. It doesn't mean it starts when you're born. If it starts when you're born, then it's not eternal. You always have been. You always will be. And many of us have had to be born again and again and again and again until we get it right. Being born again is not a prize. Being born again is not a good deal. This Nicodemus comes up to Jesus. He's got his golden hat on and his golden staff, and he's got all of his Torahs and all of his books and all of his religious stuff, and he staggers up. Uh, listen, uh, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus took one look at him. He said, oh, he's gavolt. Forget it. Forcocked it with you. You've got to be born again, pal. You're never going to get it this time around. Look at that gold hat you got on. You can't even stand up straight. <laughs> Ain't no way. You've got to be born again. You've got to unload all of that stuff that they taught you. Don't you remember when little David was going to slay Goliath? What did they say to him? Here, put on my armor. What did they say to you? Here, take the Bible. Here, take the hymns. Here, do this. Here, take baptism. Here. What did David say? Get lost with that stuff. I don't want any of that stuff. I don't need any of it. What did he take? Five smooth stones. He took control of his five senses, sight, taste, touch, smell, hearing, meditation. And then he took the stone that the builders rejected, the pineal stone, and he said, I'll knock that sucker right in the center of it. Oh, pow! Where did he hit the beast? Huh? Right. Where was Jesus crucified? Golgotha. What's Golgotha mean? Skull. Conscious. Don't you understand? You think it's all in there? Well, let's put it. He was killed in the skull. Yeah, that'll be a nice place. Golgotha. It's in the Bible. It's in there for a reason. We're, we're done. We're done. We're done. I see some of you starting to squirm. We're done. But remember, just as we, 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 we get rid of this, summer is the time of life of warmth, love, and growth. And what Jesus told us, when you see these leaves of this fig tree, as you begin this journey, you'll see the leaves. You'll begin to feel the change with inside of yourself. You will. And you don't have to prove it. You know, you don't have to come here to have this happen. Joan said, oh, don't tell them. They don't have to come. Because <laughs> when you don't come, I get depressed. You know, oh, what did I say? Hey. You know? Hey, right, yeah, hey, I'll tell you. But you can do this. Go in the bathroom. Run the water. Nobody will ever know what you're doing in there. Go in and go, run the water real loud and flush it and go home. Go home while it's flushing. They'll never know. They'll never know. Let me finish this. When you go through all of these changes that Jesus talked about, and some of them are tough, as you know, and I've come through it. Some of them are tough. I, just in the death of a flower, I found out that I wasn't as far along as I thought I was. Lost the battle. 
And there's a lot of battles that we lose. And Joan and I both found this out, you know, we try. It doesn't deprive us of teaching because we're learning at the same time you are. But life is not easy. I had a, you know, I, when I lost this dog and then the other night we went to a, a funeral. I told you about my office manager where I worked, a black lady, a very fine lady, her name was Shirley Smalls. Her son used to dance for this rap group, Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. And uh, she lived for Irwin. Irwin was her whole life, 23 years old, young kid, you know, full of life, lived every life to the minute. And uh, about three nights, four nights ago, about three o'clock in the morning, they heard this tremendous crash, explosion. They ran out, and there they saw, a hundred feet from the house, the headlights of this car hit the tree. Her son had been home at 10:30 and said, "Hey, mom, dad, I'll be home. In a, I'll be home in a couple hours. I just got to go see somebody." He died. Broken neck. What? What do you say? What are you gonna tell somebody? Except Jesus. Jesus will make it go away. Nah. Meditate, make it go away. Uh-uh. No. Nothing takes that away. I mean, you've got children. Can you imagine? Look at your daughter. You've got children. Look. Look at your kids. Can you imagine? And yet, indeed, that's what life that's what goes on in life. When I when I when I lost when John and I lost the dog, I said, "What the heck? What is this? Why do these horrible things happen?" The answer is quite simple when you think of it. Do you know how many thousands of years, how many billions of people have been radiating negative, violent thought into the universe, into the atmosphere? And do you know what has happened? Whether it be storms or whether it be the hostility that we feel, we've all absorbed it. You have an electronic computer in the center of your head and it picks up all of it. The negativity, the positiveness, and you've got to learn to start feeding that computer with the divine spark because you are subject to all of it, every one of us. And each one of us, sometime the clock comes around and we have a, a terrible situation to deal with in our, in our home, in our family. We've all had it, and we all will. But if we can get people into meditation, and the movement starts all over the universe, the positive vibrations going up into the universe will neutralize all of that negative energy that's coming down, and it will change it. It will change disease, it will change violence, and it will change all of the horror that we go through. But we have to start obeying Jesus, obeying Krishna, obeying Buddha, and start sending off those vibrations of love, and peace and good energy and it will change the universe. Because we've destroyed it with our negative thoughts and our hostility and one of the prime culprits of the whole mess, religion. And they have to stand and they have to stand back and get out of the way. Jesus didn't have any time for them. You can't either. 